Hello and welcome to another episode of Barely Contained, the podcast that takes a deep dive into the world of online showbiz journalism. My name is Matt Withers and I'm once again joined at a safe social distance of 57,936 metres by Chris Beckett to assess the very lowest tier of celebrity repertage, including Mike Pence's tight tip, Jim McDonald's milk theft, a Buffy height query and why 2020 was the year we'll all remember for falling for Princess Anne. Let's go. Hi there, Chris. Hey, Matt. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Uh, how are you? You well? Merry Christmas? Yep, yeah, Merry Christmas and a, and a bit late for that. Uh, we can say Happy New Year, can't we? Yes, uh, Happy <laughs> New Year. Um, so it'd be good to say goodbye to 2020. On that, we can be agreed, I think. Um, mm-hmm. so what, what, what do you think you'll remember the year for? Uh, well, I mean, uh, COVID. <laughs> That was a bit of a to-do, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I've got a story from the Express, and I think it'll make you uh, rethink the okay. uh, instantaneous pivot to uh, the coronavirus that you, you, you said there. This is by Frederica Miller, and it's headlined, Princess Anne 2020 in pictures, the year UK fell in love with Princess Royal. Actually, yeah, I've changed my mind. It is, it's Anne. Yeah. yeah. Right, shall we carry on with this then? Or... <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 go on. We might as well. So uh, the, the intro begins. Princess Anne turned 70 this year, and her stoic approach to royal duty has seen her gain huge popularity in Britain. A mm-hmm. body language expert who analysed pictures of Anne taken over the past 12 months has claimed 2020 is the year the public finally fell in love with Princess Anne. God, it all sounds a bit begrudging, doesn't it? <laughs> um, I mean, new sports personality of the year in 1971. Very true. Um, I mean, this is all a bit odd, isn't it? But, but we'll, we'll plough on. Yeah. Um, Princess Anne, 70, is the Queen and Prince Philip's only daughter and is celebrated for her fierce dedication a no-nonsense approach to serving the crown. Mm. Anne is known to be one of the hardest working members of the royal family and carries out hundreds of engagements every year. While the COVID-19 pandemic put a stop to many public engagements, Anne kept up with royal duty nonetheless and carried out dozens of virtual meetings. Yeah, those virtual ribbons don't cut themselves. We then go on to, uh, I mean, this is, this is an awfully long article. Um, a lot of statistics, um, just to prove all the naysayers wrong, who suggest that she might not be one of the hardest workers. Um, a lot of stats here, how many they've been, how it compares with the others. But then it mentions that she was in an ITV documentary, uh, Anne the Princess Royal at 70. Did you catch this? Uh, I didn't, no. Um, I, I'm surprised it's not been Sky <laughs> Oh, I haven't seen it either, but um, just take the Express's word for it. The documentary gave the British public a behind-the-scenes look at the Princess Royal's extraordinary schedule and included interviews with those closest to her. Body language expert and author Judy James analysed photos of Anne's most iconic moments over the past year and shared her findings with express.co.uk. Um... I think we've referred to body language expert Judy James, um... In this podcast before yes um i mean i'm no cynic a cynic would say that she tends to say whatever the journalist requires them to say for the purposes <laughs> of the article um but i wouldn't say that because that would be professionally defamatory um yes. so so what, what's judy got to say here judy said 2020 was the year that the public finally fell in love with princess Anne." Viewed in her younger years as the rather blunt and anti-glam member of the royal family, Anne was outshone and upstaged by a succession of royal brides like Diana, Sophie, Kate and Meghan, who all appeared to fit the fairy tale image of what a storybook princess should look like, more than the Queen's often dour-faced daughter. (laughs) That's a bit harsh. It's a bit harsh, isn't it? Um, I've got to say, a clean forgotten there was a Sophie. Yeah, Um, yeah. Uh, I suspect most of the public have. Uh, well, in 20 a... years' time, Judy James will be doing this very article about Sophie. 
2040 <laughs> will be remembered as the year that we all went head over heels for Sophie. Yeah. Anne developed a reputation for a similar tetchy and outspoken attitude as her father, but in an era when women were less likely to be admired for those qualities than the men. So this is 2018, <laughs> given <laughs> that she's flagging back to the dim and distant past of Meghan Markle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it really, really, a, a figure, a, a figure of, of history. Judy claimed that while Anne's straightforward approach to things previously worked against her, now it's allowed her to shine. The expert said, expert, the expert said, her very practical approach to life meant that she wore outfits that had lasted several decades rather than following any fashion trends, and her love life looked equally down to earth, with her second husband Tim keeping a low profile and no sign of any romantic PDAs, even on their wedding day. <laughs> right. It hasn't been any change in Anne that's created her current surge in popularity. It has been a change in the public's values and outlook. Yeah, she's, <laughs> she's very much played the long game. <laughs> <laughs> According to Judy, Anne's stoicism is precisely what Britain has needed during the pandemic. <laughs> you keep, keep your major Sir General Tom, <laughs> whatever his name is. Yeah. <laughs> She said, in a year of change and uncertainty, we have learned to cherish the certain. An Anne's sense of stoicism and continuity has suddenly looked more attractive than the unreliability, self-absorption and relentless drama we have seen from some of the other top-tier royals. Uh, firstly, yeah. stoicism doesn't get used anywhere as often as it has been in this article, but um, <laughs> the, the unreliability and self-absorption of some of the other top-tier royals... Mm. It goes unspoken. But I yeah, imagine um, that the Express's readers very much agree. Yes, I'm sure there's no examples of the relentless drama in any of the <laughs> other uh, express.co.uk <laughs> stories. Judy compared Anne's dedicated approach to royal duty to that of her mother, the Queen's. The analyst <laughs> said, like her mother, she does royalty the old-fashioned way. She might be opinionated, but she doesn't push those opinions on the public and she doesn't do self-pity either. Her one raised brow and her twinkling eye expression suggests a shared sense of humour during catastrophe and her determination to not seek attention unless it's of value to her causes is the perfect answer to the narcissism of the selfie generation. <laughs> What I really like about that paragraph is that you could say exactly the same thing about Bernard Matthews. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and he, he was a, a, a slaughterer of, uh, of, of, the, of the turkey community. Um, I mean, I don't know about if this selfie generation uh, with the narcissism to which she refers have recently, Chris, tried to come on our train and set up a rival podcast. What? Yeah, yeah, there's a couple of royals. Um, Judy James might be referring to not. Yeah, they, they, they've uh, seen a success that barely contain this having, and they fancy yeah. a bit of that action. Well, you know, welcome to the big leagues. <laughs> yeah, it's not as easy as you think. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it, takes, it takes hours to get this good. <laughs> Anne also seems to have the best relationships with both her mother and her daughter Zara. In a world where the children of A-list celebs and leading royals are consistently illustrating the pressures of growing up in a goldfish bowl world, Anne's daughter Zara seems to be permanently happy and very much in love with her husband. Um, goldfish bowl world is the shittest theme park I've ever, <laughs> ever been to. Um, yeah. You know, those, those castles, it looks like they're a full one from the front. There's nothing behind. You know, mm. it's, it's absolutely appalling. Full of ring toss games as well. <laughs> yeah, that's all they've got. Judy dubbed Anne the unsung heroine of the royal lineup for the quiet manner in which she gets on with things. The expert said, Anne's dedication to hard work has made her the unsung heroine of the royal lineup for years. But suddenly we are living in an era where all those morale boosting visits and kind words are vital for our survival as a nation. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Anne didn't need to up her work rate to fill the gaps left by the royals that left the firm. Hmm. She was already busy doing her duty for years. It's just it's only during a pandemic that we've taken time to notice. Uh, um, I hadn't noticed. Yeah, I, I see her very much as the James Milner of the royal family. Yes, she can do a job in any position you put her in. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> never lets you down. Yeah, she doesn't mind being benched because she knows it's a squad game. Yep. Bless her. <laughs> right, Matt, I've got a slightly offbeat story uh, for you today. Um, it's from uh, The Independent. Mike Pence accused of leaving, in quotes, shameful tip on restaurant bill. Well, it's a, a bit out of the, the comfort zone for us, Chris, because ordinarily we wouldn't do the politics. Yes, um, I mean, this is pretty fierce politics. OK, well, you know, strap yourselves in, people. Vice President Mike Pence has been accused of under-tipping after his alleged receipts were shared on social media. Yeah, you've got to be careful with the, uh, the legalities. Yeah. A Twitter user claimed that the Republican politician had only tipped a few dollars after a visit to a cafe. A friend's friend works at a restaurant that served at Mike underscore Pence at lunch today. He tipped $5 on a $45 bill. This is who these people are. Remember that always. Yeah, I will do because I don't know about you, Chris, but until I heard about this story, I always thought of him as a benevolent uncle. You were a card-carrying <laughs> Republican. I just thought that he was just, you know, he was just a, a, a nice guy, you know, just trying to do his best for America and the world. Um, but I, I hear this and I think, he's a monster. Yeah. He later added, the issue here is that he should be shamed for under-tipping. Yeah, we got that. Yeah, it's, as opposed to eating in a restaurant. <laughs> The vice president allegedly ordered two Chipotle chicken sandwiches, ginger ale, and two hot chocolates. Allegedly uh, is the key thing here. We're not stating this as a fact. It's just what we're can we can we get this by the lawyer? Hang on, hang <laughs> yeah. on. Yeah, put it allegedly around that. Really, the the decadence of the Trump regime writ large. There, two hot chocolates, <laughs> ginger ale. How were Enid Brighton? In another reply, uh, Chaheda said the minimum wage. The, in another reply, Chaheda said the minimum wage for service is eight dollars something in Beaver Creek, where this restaurant is. Any good person would have tipped at least nine to ten dollars on this bill. That's what this is about. Oh, this, what was Mike Pence thinking of while he was eating out in Beaver Creek? <laughs> it was just all about the Chipotle. <laughs> Twitter users reacted to the viral claim with one working out what they believe Pence should have tipped. Oh, get your calculator out. Apparently, it should have been at least $15. Some were also angry due to the impact of the pandemic on the hospitality industry. Others agreed that the alleged actions demonstrate the true character of a tipper. <laughs> a few claimed it showed inherent problems with the tipping system. The vice president is reportedly on holiday in Colorado. Well, laying low, presumably. Yeah. You know, all the things that this regime has done over the past four years, and this is the one that he has to lay low over. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can see why we generally steer clear of politics, but... <laughs> yeah, because we don't, we don't really know about it, do we? <laughs> okay, Matt, I hope you've got something a bit... Uh, a bit less highbrow after all that. Yes, I have. Um, we're back to what we know best. Uh, just really bad, really bad celebrity journalism. Uh, this is from express.co.uk again. Uh, it's by Katie Palmer. And it's one of the, I think, most egregious examples of the Express relying entirely on what people are looking for on Google to decide what they're going to write about. It's headlined, Seth Green height. How tall is the Buffy Allstar? Okay. This is quite a while ago that he was in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, is it not? I believe that the series finished around two decades ago. <laughs> but it's still the first thing on everyone's mind. <laughs> Seth Green is known for playing the character Oz in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. How tall is the Buffy Allstar? Okay. It goes on. Seth Green is a world-renowned actor and comedian. Is he world-renowned? Uh, US renowned. Yeah. I'm going to say, if he walked in here now, I mean, that would be odd for Stark. It, it, it would be odd. The front door's locked um, and it would be um, contravening COVID rules. 
But yeah. I wouldn't think uh, you're Seth Green from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. No, no. And he would probably not say, you know, <laughs> you're Matt Withers from Barely Contained. No, no, he would not because it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an oral medium, really. <laughs> um, Seth Green is a world-renowned action comedian who is known for his roles in Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Family Guy. The 46-year-old actor and voice artist from Pennsylvania joined the cast of Buffy in 1997 as the half-human, half-werewolf Oz Osborne. Fans are keen to know how tall the action producer is. And express.co.uk has all you need to know. I mean, there are things revealed in that sentence alone that are more interesting than how tall he is. <laughs> Much more interesting. What would you have nosed off on? Uh, I don't know that he's a, you know, he's a, a producer. I didn't know that. Uh, I, I, I didn't know he was from Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why would you? Frankly? No. Okay. Um, you probably have already guessed how, with which three words the next paragraph is going to begin with. Mm -hmm. Seth Green is a well-known actor and director who is known for his roles in the Austin Powers series, Guardians of the Galaxy series, and he voices the hilarious Chris Griffin in the animated adult comedy show Family Guy. He started acting at the age of seven and started out in the world of film before moving on to TV series, including the supernatural teen drama Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Later on in his career, he wrote and directed his first film called Changeland, which was released in 2019. He is also the co-creator of Robot Chicken, another animated comedy sketch show. Okay. Um, <laughs> Wikipedia doing yeah, a lot the, of heavy lifting here. A lot of... Uh, Wikipedia should get a joint byline on this story. and It, it should go ahead of Katie Palmer. Fans have often commented on the star's height as he's visibly much shorter than many of his co-stars in Buffy and other series. How tall is Seth Green? <laughs> <laughs> according to celebheights.com, <laughs> which apparently is a thing, according to celebheights.com, actor Green is between five foot three inches and five foot four inches, or a little more than 160 centimetres tall. I'm good. We're glad we've really nailed it down. <laughs> Yeah. And you'd think at that point that would be a good, you know, you'd end the, um, you'd, you'd end the, the story. Um, but no, uh, Katie Plowers on the website quoted the star as making a joke about his height when asked how tall he was. He said, I'm not five foot five. How's that? And I'm probably small enough to fit into places that other people couldn't. Hmm. <laughs> what, like articles in express.co.uk? <laughs> Speaking to E! Online, he said, I'm 5'4". Hey, Rene Russo walked in a ditch when she filmed Free Jack with Emilio Estevez. The great thing about this business is it's not about how you look, it's how they can make you look. Mm. In 1994, he joked about wishing he could be three inches taller so he could reach taller cabinets. It's just a legacy of laughter. <laughs> Height-related gags. Oh, I, I, at, at that point, you think he, you know, he, his film career was going. He could have just afforded to have smaller cabinets. Mm. Have them moved a bit further yeah. down the wall. Um, but no. In Buffy the Vampire Slayer, he played the kind and quirky boyfriend of Willow Rosenberg, brackets, Alison Hannigan. His co star, Hannigan, was just taller than him, five foot four inches. Some of his other Buffy stars were much taller with Angel actor David Boronaz and Giles actor Anthony Stewart Head standing at six foot tall. It's amazing they had such a, you know, a varied cast, height-wise. Well, I think um, Buffy, in this regard, was well ahead of the game in terms of promoting <laughs> diversity among its yeah. actors. Because some, some of them were taller than others, and some of them, Chris, were shorter than others. Mm. I remember the days in, in Hollywood where they used to have one of those, you know, you have to be this tall to appear in the film. <laughs> yeah, as you're going into the studios and there'd be black market Cuban heel salesmen lurking yeah. around outside. <laughs> Terrible times. Oh, and on, on, the cast of, on the cast of Buffy, they, they would lark around uh, about how different their heights were and say, you know what, in a quarter of a century, somebody will write about this. Yeah. The star is married to actress and model Claire Grant, and in an interview with Access Daily in 2019, 
he said people did not believe they were married. Uh, his wife, Grant, stands at five foot seven inches. At <laughs> so least... those two could be married. <laughs> at least... They're different heights, for God's sake. Yeah. Does anybody have any reason why these two should not be legally wed? No! <laughs> Fans, I'm sorry, this, this does go on. I apologise to everyone. Oh, no, please carry on. Fans took to Reddit to discuss the actor's height after a photo was shared of Green standing next to his wife at a red carpet event. One fan said, I never knew he was that small. While another fan said, Seth didn't let his height bog him down to become a favourite actor. Some people stew in it and end up not achieving their dreams because they're sad about it. Mm. And if he got bogged down even further, he'd be shorter. <laughs> he would, yeah. He, would, he, he wouldn't be able to get out. They wouldn't be able to pull him out of that bog. <laughs> like the never-ending story. Fans were gutted when he left the series, saying he was one of the most underrated characters on the teen drama. One said on Reddit, how can anyone hate him? He's really the only one with absolute common sense and less biased opinions. He looks at everything from a logical yet sincere side. Or at least for the most part. Do you know who he reminds me of, Chris? Princess Who? Anne. Princess yeah. Anne, the Princess Royal. Um, Very much. That's the, what I look for, though. You know, if I'm watching a fantasy series like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, I'm not looking for any, you know, hijinks or vampire slaying or supernatural daring do. I'm just looking for non-biased ob- objectivity. Do you, uh, if you're interested in any other stories about Buffy the Vampire Slayer, there are some related links here. Um, oh, yeah? You could click on, Buffy, how old was David Barinas in Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Or, Buffy, why did Seth Green leave Buffy as Oz? Or, <laughs> Buffy, are Buffy and Angel really soulmates? Or, Buffy, why did Christine Sutherland leave as Buffy's mother, Joyce? Or, Buffy, <laughs> why did Buffy and Riley split? Relationship explained. Now, <laughs> little peek behind the curtain here. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of places write stories based entirely on what their SEO team say that people are searching for on <laughs> on on Google. Uh, this is seems... too much, Matt. Get put that wizard sleeve away. <laughs> um, a lot of people are obviously um, googling about Buffy, but. I think the Express website is now so dependent on what people are searching for on Google. It's only a matter of time until it runs a story headlined, Rhythm. How do I spell rhythm? (laughs) Rhythm is best known as a strong, regularly repeated pattern of movement and sound. But how do you spell the tricky word? Yeah. Well, we'll be there, rest assured. (laughs) Oh, God. And uh, for the final story of this episode, Chris, I believe you've got a story about Charlie Lawson, probably best known for playing Jim McDonald in Coronation Street. Yes, I I would agree. (laughs) And this is by uh, Daily Star Online's Jerry Lawton. Headline, Corrie's Charlie Lawson says he'll rip milk thieves' arms off if he catches culprits. Oh, lovely stuff. (laughs) <laughs> Real heartwarming one to go out on. <laughs> Coronation Street actor Charlie Lawson, who played Jim McDonald, has issued a strong warning to a local milk thief who keeps pinching the morning pints from outside his front door. Ooh. Drama worthy of Corrie itself. <laughs> Coronation Street legend Charlie Lawson turned into a real-life Jim McDonald, warning a village milk thief, I'll rip your friggin' arms off. Oh, lovely accent. Chris. Apologies to anyone who lives on the island of Ireland there. <laughs> I, I think that, that um, the thing that's most likely to bring a return to conflict there, Chris, is, is not so much the, the border and Brexit, it was your attempt at impersonation there. <laughs> I thought it was all right. Yeah. The actor who played Killer Jim in the ITV soap for 11 years saw red after a thirsty thief keeps pinching his morning pints. Mm. I mean, only thirsty if we're working on the assumption that it was just to be drunk outright, rather than used as uh, an ingredient in a recipe. Yeah, I mean, it's conjecture really, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Stick to the facts. He has been hit so many times in his Cheshire village, he has laid in wait in a bid to snare the culprits and was livid when he just missed catching them in the act. 
So I would love to see a kind of a mini series based on this, kind of like um, Wiley Coyote and Roadrunner. And yeah. each episode would be Jim McDonald using a different kind of item from the Acme catalog uh, to try and get the first thief, but being thwarted each time. Never, never quite succeeding. Charlie, 61, tweeted, to the little shit in our village who keeps nicking our milk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's uh, spent a bit of time in Scotland. <laughs> I was thinking that in the space of one sentence, he kind of went from from Ulster to wee Jimmy Cranky. <laughs> Missed you by a whisker this morning. Be real careful. If I catch you, I'll rip your friggin' arms off. One shocked fan replied, Geez, Charlie, haven't you the great way with words? The actor replied, Makes me angry. As someone said, Knock on me door, and if you're that desperate, I'll do you a cup of tea myself. Other fans compared Northern Irishman Charlie's threat to one of his Corrie character, Jim's. During his explosive time in Corrie, MacDonald beat up his wife in the street and was jailed for eight years for the manslaughter of gangster Jez Quickly, played by actor Lee Boardman, 48. Lovely bit of detail. (laughs) One fan messaged... If that was back home, Jim, they'd be kneecapped, so they would. Oh, where did the accent go? <laughs> I mean, that was not that was not Jim. No, that but was not Charlie. No, so I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to prejudge. Well, the, uh, he says if that was fan. back home, so I, I, I think we're. I think this is a fellow, a, a fellow Ulsterman. I mean, I can do it again. I'm, I'm happy to. Yeah, go on. It's a little treat. <laughs> one, one fan message. If that was back home, Jim, they'd be kneecaps. <laughs> they would. Jesus wept. <laughs> Another said, the last person to rob your milk was Jez Quigley, and look what happened to him. It is not the first time Charlie has threatened vengeance. <laughs> God. Earlier in 2020, he warned he would end up in jail if he ever again met the director of the play he was starring in when he collapsed on stage. The actor suffered a mini stroke two years ago during the opening night of the drama Rebus, Long Shadows, in which he portrayed author Ian Rankin's famous detective. Charlie had been diagnosed with exhaustion, but continued in the role after a contretemps with the production's director, only to suffer a transient ischemic attack, known as TIA, during the second half in front of an 1100 strong audience in Edinburgh. It's taken a very dark turn, this story about the fact of some milk, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure this is the level of vengeance that uh, <laughs> uh, Charlie is, is, is angling at. And um, yeah, also um, harking back to quite a traumatic time in his life. Uh, again, perhaps not comparable with uh, him losing the occasional uh, bottle of gold top. No, no, some perspective is needed here, I, I, I suspect. Yeah. Nice use of uh, contretemps, though. Don't see contretemps enough, do you, in the, uh, in the red tops? You really don't. He said he felt betrayed by the director over the incident and would never forgive him for it. I really hope I don't meet him on a Friday night, otherwise I'll be in jail, he said. <laughs> Accurately. I, I'm just looking at the comments and somebody said, put loads of laxatives in milk. He won't be back, mainly because he won't be able to leave Lou, which could definitely be one of the episodes of the Roadrunner-style uh, Jim McDonald series. Now, it's funny that you noticed that because I also, <laughs> I thought, well, it's definitely the, the most interesting comment out, out of about six or seven that are left. But practically, what would the logic be <laughs> in filling your own milk? With laxatives, <laughs> when your problem is not getting your milk. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, they've not thought that one through, have they? They're, they're not really. <laughs> well, that was a lovely way on which to leave uh, the first barely contained of 2021. Uh, yes. Hopefully, there will be many more. Um, and it's a much better year than the previous one, although we don't, we don't wish to see an improvement in the quality of stories. Otherwise, uh, this would all be over. Hey, Chris, if yeah. people wish to uh, follow us on the, uh, the old social media channels on the information superhighway, which direction would you point them in? 
I would say go to uh, at barely underscore pod on Twitter or I'll rip your friggin' arms off. Oh, lovely. Lovely stuff. <laughs> or you can go to Facebook um, where we have a presence uh, barely contained the podcast. Um, can people find us on TikTok? They cannot find us on TikTok. <laughs> no, they cannot. Well, thank you very much for that, Chris. And we'll no doubt speak again very soon. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Have a good one. Bye.